Serene, you're an engineer specializing in renewable technology, an entrepreneur, a media personality nominated by BBC 100 Women, and a mother of two. So I think we'll have a lot to talk about. Let's do it. Let's start with renewable energy. I'm wondering how you see the ongoing debate on climate change and the global demand for more clean energy. Well, it's a long running but valid debate as long as it's not political. And yes, climate change and global warming are valid reasons for Definitely not the first one. What is the first reason then? The first reason for renewable energy is what life after fossil fuel is going to be like and how to get people off fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Another motivation, of course, is climate change and global warming. And the answer for both is by using sustainable source of energy. We know for sure at some point the fossil fuels will be depleted. And the real data we have today shows that by 2050, the population energy demand will be tripled. However, the energy sources we have won't be able to ramp up to cover the need. And the population will have increased as well? The population will be increased by 2050. The world population will be more than 9 billion. And 1 billion of those won't be able to afford any source of energy. So it's a real demand. When we're talking about renewable energy, do we consider nuclear energy as part of the solution? When we talk about renewable energy, normally we refer to the clean, non-carbon emitting energy, namely wind, solar, geothermal, hydro, biomass technology. Nuclear energy, although it is somehow renewable, but definitely not a clean energy. Actually, every nuclear facility releases a variety of cancer-causing radionuclides, in addition to the radioactive waste that needs hundreds of years to go away. Are you concerned about possibilities of nuclear accidents, things like that as it's well? It's very likely to happen, and also the uncertain future if this technology fell in the wrong hand. But my understanding is the U.S. Congress is really interested, is pushing for nuclear energy. Because there is a lot of potential as a sustainable and reliable technology, I know Bill Gates is pushing the Congress to secure federal financial support for nuclear R&D. So are we going to witness a zero radioactive wastes? Are we going to produce nuclear fusion technology? I don't know. <laughs> Looking at the whole world, what's holding us back from pushing for 100% clean energy use? From a technology standpoint, I think we are moving really fast to achieve this goal. If I would talk about wind energy, five years ago, we didn't have a single wind turbine with more than four megawatt capacity. Today, we are talking about 12 megawatt capacity. So that's why we can not look at the state of our technology today and say, hey, this is all what we have mm -hmm. because the technology is blowing. The challenge, though, is the reliability of this technology. And the question is, can we provide energy storage that can compete in price with natural gas? I think the storage and the energy storage would be the, the field that we need to work on. Mm -hmm. Do we have enough clean energy sources to power the entire world? Oh, absolutely. Three quarters of the world is unused water. This water can be turned into a hydropower. When today we have 1,700 terawatts of potential power mm -hmm. and all what we need by 2050 is no more than 50 terawatts of power. But what about the physical footprint in in, for both wind and solar? Isn't there a big impact? It's interesting because wind by far is the smallest footprint on the ground. It's actually just the pole mm -hmm. touching the ground. Spacing is something else. People confuse footprint with spacing. Yes, we need spacing between these turbines, but we can use these lands for multi-purposing like farming so, and landscaping. And also we have the offshore winds. But do you think we're ready for it? Do you think people are ready to accept a whole new technology? If we can provide this technology at lower price, they will go for it. But in general, people would resist everything. It's a part of our human nature to resist any new things on all levels. Even with technology? Even with technology. I would give you an example that might be shocking. If you can recall when the cell phone was introduced, that was early 90s. When the cell phone was firstly introduced, there was a constant objection to it. Do you know what was this? Why do we need a cell phone? 
we have a wireless phone. Why do we need a cell phone? We have a wireless phone. Back then, the cell phone was big, expensive with big antenna. Mm -hmm. Today, we're asking the same question. Why do we need renewable energy? We have oil. <laughs> Why do we need autonomous cars? We can drive. I'd like to switch gears now and ask you, as a working mother and wife, how do you balance personal life with career? Well, the truth is that I don't balance, and I don't think anyone can do it all. I personally don't follow this balancing theory because what balancing suggests that if you succeeded in one side, you failed the other. Mm -hmm. And that's, by the way, our subconscious attitudes about women in business. And that's why we keep asking this, how do you balance question? You wouldn't ask me this question if I were a man, would you? Because we put a lot of responsibilities and obligations on women than we put on men. So how do you manage then? I juggle. I trained myself to be a good juggler. It takes some time, of course, but my whole life is based on priorities and it is all circular around these priorities. Can you give an example of, of priorities here? So for example, I am a mother of two little girls mm -hmm. and this stage in my life as a mother and for them is very important. So they are now the top of my priorities and everything else goes around them, even my work and everything. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean by being a juggler, because when you are a juggler, you hold and throw three or four balls. But every time you get a chance to hold one ball for a certain undistracted time until the next one comes down. Some tasks have more priorities, so you need to hold them for a longer time. Mm -hmm. Some tasks have lower priorities, so you can throw them up in the sky, like my home now, it's somewhere <laughs> up there. So imagine now if you are two jugglers, mm -hmm. namely a husband and a wife, who can share certain goals and common responsibilities, it's going to be much easier because every time you throw him a ball, you know that that ball in a safe hands, why you focus on the other ball. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's very important to have a supportive and juggler partner with you. I can see that it, it makes a world of difference. But I still wonder if there aren't times when all the balls collide and and things are very difficult. It happens sometimes. Sometimes you get all these balls over your head. And that's why you need to be really professional. And you need to train yourself with all these responsibilities. And every time you need to do the trade-off. And there is a lot of compromising along the way. It's normal. Mm -hmm. well, what about you? How were you able to succeed? Did you have a mentor? I don't have a mentor, but I was born and grew up in a very scientific environment. Actually, my father is an electronic scientist, so we grew up with all these integrated circuits, ICs, and <laughs> electrical components around us, and that's, of course, impacted my in, uh, personality. And uh, I think I got these electron electronic genes from my father. <laughs> Serene, I'd like to ask you, as a practicing Muslim and also as a woman in science, if you see a contradiction there, do religion and science conflict with each other? Well, obviously they are not. Well, it depends on the way we look at the religion. For me, my religion got my back in science. And I believe it gives me a huge push to pursue in scientific um, filled. I know that you have quite a following here, but also in the Middle East. I, I'm, my sense is that people in the Middle East are very happy that you succeeded, and I wonder if you can tell me a little about why they look up to you. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I think they are look up to me because they see a sort of hope, mm -hmm. um, because we don't fit in any stereotype, especially the stereotype that represented in the Western media. Unfortunately, the media today picture the Muslim woman in a very bad and sad way, mm -hmm. which the reality is completely different. There are a lot of Muslim women successful on all levels. The same thing in the Middle East. So when people see someone successful and practicing Muslim women, they feel happy because they represent the reality of them. It's a very hopeful reality. And thank you so much. It's been delightful to talk to you today. Thank you so much.